So we're going to go into our time of the word. Give it up for the worship team. Thank you, guys. As you know, we've been on a series. Uh, we began a series last week on the Holy Spirit. How many people have been blessed by that? Woo! Awesome, awesome. So we're going to continue that series today. So can y'all help me welcome Pastor Paul to the stage? Good morning, church family. How y'all feeling? Doing good? Can we give God one more good hand clap before we go any further? Man, it is good to see everyone this morning. I, didn't, I woke up and didn't know if it was winter or, or if it was spring. Uh, so, um, but it's good to see everyone. So we've started a series on the Holy Spirit that I am really, really ex excited about and I believe will bless you. Uh, last week was our first of the collection of talks and I pray that you would just make a commitment right now that you wouldn't miss any, any of the Sundays. Uh, and so um, last week we talked about the person of the Holy Spirit the person of the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit is not some force or some uh, wind or, or a fire or some electrical force, uh, but the Holy Spirit is a person. Uh, he's a third person of the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And this is so important to understand because if we relate to the Holy Spirit as a power or as an it, we will never understand who he is and we'll be missing out on much of what God has for us uh, in, in our journey of faith. And so uh, today uh, I want to talk about the Holy Spirit, our help. Somebody say help. Say it again. Say help. Holy Spirit, our help. I remember going to the pool for the first time with my sister, my older sister, and uh, we're walking into the pool. We're checking in, and I'm just elated. It's the first time going to a pool, uh, just ecstatic, just bouncing uh, the whole time. And I finally get closer and closer to the pool. She's holding my hand, and lo and behold, I rip my hand out of her hand, and I run in and dive into the deep end. And now now friends, there's a problem with that because I don't know how to swim, right? So I didn't know how to swim at that point. So I jump in, I'm flailing for life, and guess what comes out of my mouth? Help! Somebody help me, help me, help me. And so my sister dives in and she rescues me. She was a hero and she saved me that day. And so uh, maybe you haven't dealt with the diving in a pool and not knowing how to swim, or maybe you have, I don't know, but uh, maybe you have uh, walked through life knowing that you need help. Uh, knowing that you need help maybe in decisions that you got to make, help in your walk with God, maybe help in your marriage, maybe help with a struggle that you have, m maybe help in, in some area of your life. You need help. And, and, and so here uh, we're going to discover what the scriptures say about the Holy Spirit, specifically what Jesus says about the role and the ministry of the Holy Spirit in our lives, and that is to bring what? Help. Come on, let's say it again like we need to say help. help. That's right. Y'all need some help. All right, let's stand up and read the word of God. We're going to be at uh, John chapter 14 is where we're going to start off at John chapter 14. I encourage you <clears throat> to uh, open up your Bibles or whatever you got going on today from John chapter 14. We're going to be in 14, 15, and 16. Uh, and uh, I just encourage you to trek along with me on this, okay? Y'all ready? Y'all ready? All right. John 14, uh, verses 16 and 18, it says, Jesus says, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper. Everybody say another. Another helper that he may abide with you forever. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him. For he dwells with you and will be in you. For he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. This is the word of the Lord. And the church says, amen. amen. You may be seated. Glorious and heavenly Father, we thank you for this precious word. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would bring illumination a revelation to this word, cause it to uh, come alive in our hearts because your word is alive. Cause our minds to be attentive, our hearts to be open to receive, and our ears to be listening to what your spirit is saying. We thank you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so where we start off at here is, is uh, um, 
is John chapter 14. And now what's unique and special about John chapter 14 uh, to 16 is that in John's gospel, it records Jesus' conversation with his disciples at the Last Supper. It's called uh, uh, the, uh, the Upper Room Discourse or the Farewell Discourse. This is the last moments that Jesus has with his disciples uh, before he uh, is put on the cross and dies. And so this isn't a large gathering that Jesus is talking to. It isn't a public teaching with gawkers and listeners and, and passerbys. It isn't that. It's an intimate dinner with his closest friends. And just in a few hours, he'll be dying on the cross. It's a very serious and important time that Jesus has with his closest friends. Very important time. And so he gives them vital instructions on, uh, on how to live, on vital instructions before he departs from them. And so Jesus could have spoke about any different thing, could he not? I'm, I mean, if, it's, if this is going to be the last time that he's speaking with his disciples, you got to imagine what he's going to say is pretty important, right? And so he could have talked about church. He could have talked about politics. He could have talked about relationships. He could have talked about finances. Jesus could have talked about the end times. All these things are important, but he didn't talk about any of those things. You see, Jesus spent time talking about the Holy Spirit because no one knows his role and his character better than Jesus does. And so he starts off uh, chapter 14 saying, do not let your hearts be troubled. Why is he saying that? Because his disciples hear about him leaving. Jesus saying, I'm, I'm going to leave you. I'm about to leave you. They don't fully understand it, but he says, I'm going away. I'm leaving you. And, and so the, he's saying, don't let your hearts be troubled. And then he goes into the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And so to understand this, uh, what this word helper means, this word is used five times in the scriptures describing uh, Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Five times, we're going to look at four of them today, so it's important that we understand what this word means. And now, uh, I share different words all the time, and I know you probably don't remember any of them, but I want you to remember this one. This word uh, in the original writing is, is parakletos. Everyone say parakletos. parakletos. Say it again. Say it with a little pizzazz. Parakletos. <laughs> Uh, and basically what this, my wife is going to correct me. She actually speaks Greek, so she's like, nah, that's not how you say it. So uh, in the vernacular of the day, when he's describing uh, the Holy Spirit, he's describing this perikletos as someone that pleads your case. It's, it's like it describes a lawyer in a courtroom that's advocating, that's, that's speaking and pleading on behalf of your case, that's counseling you. This is, this is what that word, how the word that Jesus decided to use to describe the ministry of the Holy Spirit as someone that's pleading your case like a lawyer, someone that's standing by your side. Some other words that this word is impossible to even describe in, in, in just a few words, it's, it's, it's so broad and it's so rich. This word can mean comforter, can mean an advocate, can mean an intercessor, can mean a counselor, can mean a strengthener, can be a, mean a stand by any one of these things describes the ministry of the Holy Spirit that Jesus is describing. And so when you break down this word, perikletos, a little bit more, this word para means alongside or very close, meaning alongside or very close. In fact, the Apostle Paul used this word to describe his relationship with his spiritual son, Timothy, and saying, there's no one else that's closer to me than Timothy. He is my spiritual son. He's close to me. And so this person would be, this para would be close to you, would be alongside of you. My para would be my wife. She's the closest to me. We walk together, we talk together, we eat together, we do everything together. And so he's describing the Holy Spirit as someone that's alongside of you. And this word cleo, para cleo, means to beckon or to call. To beckon or to call. And Apostle Paul uses this word when he says, I am called an apostle to the Gentiles. So it's speaking of a calling. It's speaking of a divine calling that's given. And so when you put these words together, describing the ministry and the person of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is permanently called alongside you to provide direction, comfort, encouragement, counsel on life journey. This is his calling and his assignment. Come on, somebody. We need to give the Lord a hand clap for that. He's called. 
to be alongside you. He's called to be your advocate. He's called to be your counselor. He's called to be the one right by your side through thick and through thin. When everyone else walks out the door, guess who's still with you? The Holy Spirit. He's with you. And Jesus says, uh, this helper, he says, another helper. Everyone say another. another. It's important that we understand what this word another means. Uh, I went to uh, a while back to, to rent a car, and it, I was going to be doing a lot of driving. And so the gas prices were ridiculous at the time. I'm like, hey, give me something compact. Give me something very fuel efficient. And I show up, and they say, sorry, we don't have the compact fuel efficient car, but we have another one for you. And they uh, point over to this Dodge Ram pickup truck. I'm like, no. That is not another. That's something else. I don't want that gas guzzler. I don't want to be broke this weekend, right? So it's like, uh, that is not another. So they gave me another vehicle, another compact car that was fuel efficient. So Jesus is saying another, another one that's just like me, the very same kind and quality. He's saying, I will send another just like me. And so when we look at verse 17, there's a couple of things that I want to look at. One is that he says that this helper, another helper, he says, he dwells with you. What tense is that? Present. He will dwell with you. And then he says, he will be in you. Future. He, is, uh, he, will dw he dwells with you now, and he will be in you in the future. And so Jesus is sending a very, very clear message. The Holy Spirit would be just like himself, a perfect representation of him in every single way. The Holy Spirit would minister, would mirror Jesus, and whatever Jesus would say, whatever Jesus would do, is whatever the Holy Spirit would say, and whatever the Holy Spirit would do, they would act accordingly. And so it would be a mirror of Jesus presently when he says, the Holy Spirit dwells with you now. It's like, hold on, you said the Holy Spirit was coming. How can he dwell with us now and then come in us later and dwell in us later? So what Jesus is articulating and sharing to his disciples is, is that what you are presently experiencing is me as your helper, as your standby, as your counselor, as your comforter, as your strengthener by your side. I am your advocate now that you're experiencing, but soon you will experience a helper by spirit. Y'all with me? So they are experiencing the helper now to a degree in Jesus, but they will experience the manifestation of the helper in them when the Holy Spirit will come. And so uh, Jesus is, is, is saying that the Holy Spirit will continue his exact ministry in their lives. The ministry that Jesus had in their lives, the Holy Spirit will continue that same exact ministry in their lives. Listen to this. <clears throat> what Jesus was to the disciples, the Holy Spirit is to you. What Jesus was to the disciples, the Holy Spirit is to you. Oh, man, I just wish I lived in the days of Jesus, you know, walking along with his flowing robe. I would have been walking right by him. No, you wouldn't have. It would have been a crowd of people everywhere. You wouldn't have been able to even see him. But now, the Spirit of God, in fact, in scriptures, it says the Spirit of Jesus is called the Holy Spirit, is now in you 24-7 completely accessible any time of day or night in you. And so you want to know what the Holy Spirit's like? Read the Gospels. Spend, pour your heart out in the Gospels. What would Jesus do? That's what the Holy Spirit would do. You know, the enemy has tried to put so much fear. Oh, we love Jesus. is so loving. Look, he got the lamb over his neck. He's so sweet. Look at that. He, he's so kind. The Holy Spirit, I don't know. It's like Jesus is saying, look, look, if you're not scared of me and if you believe I'm loving and look at my spirit because he's a mirror of me. He, do, he does exactly what I do, okay? So now he calls him the helper. Now, in what ways is the Holy Spirit helping us? It's a very important question. Okay, we're going to go through uh, chapter 14, some of 15, and end and, and with 16 and start looking <clears throat> at the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Now let's go to a little bit further down to verse 25 of chapter 15 of John. <clears throat> and now we look at some of the Holy Spirit's work, his ministry, the way that he helps us. It says here in verse 25, these things I have spoken to you while being present with you, but the helper there, that word goes again, 
the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. The Holy Spirit helps by teaching us. The Holy Spirit helps by teaching us. You know, Jesus' primary ministry when he lived and walked this earth was to teach his disciples about everything, about ministry, about finances, about relationship, about the kingdom. He was teaching them about all these things. He was constantly teaching. And so Jesus' ministry has not ended. Jesus is still teaching right now. And there are a couple of different ways, two primary ways. There are other ways, but two primary ways I want to look at. One is the Holy Spirit teaches us through the Word of God. And we can see that in, <clears throat> in 2 Timothy three sixteen and 17. This is what it says. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every, just church work? No, for every good work. So if you want to know, uh, you know, if you want to know about a book, you go to the author, right? All these authors go on tours and stuff and sharing their heart. What was the message behind the book? And they share all this stuff where their heart came behind the book. And now if you want to know uh, the author of the scriptures, you are to go to the Holy Spirit and ask him to teach you. You know, the Bible was dry and dare I even say boring until I began to ask the Holy Spirit to teach me. So boring. It's like almost like, oh, it's just history. It's just facts. I got to memorize all this stuff. And then it's like, Holy Spirit, teach me. It's like, it's like the, everything comes alive because you're actually going to the one that's written it to, to explain and make it real to you. The Holy Spirit is constantly shining light on the Word of God into our hearts. You see, what's unique and special about the Bible is that you don't read the Bible. The Bible reads you. Oh, you, you thought you were reading the Bible. No, 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 no. The Spirit of God is opening the Scripture and reading the deepest desires of your heart. The motives of our heart, the things that are going through our mind, it is reading the insides of us. It's reading us. It is alive and active. And the only way to know the Word is to know the Spirit behind the Word. John 6, 63 says, the words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. So the only way to know of the things of the spirit is to know the word, right? Uh, it's not like I, I think, I hope the spirit might be like this. No, 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 no that, throw all that away. Look at the word. What does the word say about who the spirit is? If you want to know the word, you have to know the spirit. Jesus says, my words are spirit and they are life. They are alive. And so we, we, we uh, are taught by God's word primarily. And the other part is that we are taught through life experience as well, too. Anyone ever been taught through a life experience from the Holy Spirit? For sure. It's, it, it, it's one of the best teaching tools that he can use outside of the scripture and while using the scripture. Uh, no life experience is wasted. You know, no life experience is wasted when the Holy Spirit is always looking to develop us and to grow us through life that we experience. <clears throat> One time I had, I was coming years ago, I was coming out of a conference and I walk up to my car and uh, I noticed that my car window was broken and someone had stole my book bag in there. Backpack, book bag, whatever. So, uh, and then, yeah, that's sad, right? But the even sadder thing about that is I had a brand new MacBook in there, uh, noise cancellation, earphones, and a whole bunch of uh, uh, SD cards, right? That are very important pictures and stuff. So, yeah, I'm still a little bit salty about the whole thing. So, uh, someone steals it, right? And then, I, you know, file the report, all that stuff. It's gone. I'm like, man, this is crazy. And then, so I get a text from someone uh, later that night, uh, someone from, from the, that was at the event, and they said, hey, did you lose something? I'm like, yeah, like, how did you know? Like, are, are you involved? Like, uh, they said, no, they said, uh, someone, they, they said someone just texted me and they said they found, uh, they found my number and I didn't lose anything. So I just thought that, hey, maybe it's you. It's a good start, right? <laughs> so she, <laughs> yeah, it says something, right? I'd be losing stuff, right? So, um, 
she texted me or she texted me and then she gave me their number and I said, okay, let me find out from them. So I, I send this mysterious person a text message and they reply and they said, hey, yeah, I have your stuff. Come to such and such address. I'm like, hey, either this is God's redemptive plan or they were so glad with the first uh, spoils that they want to come and get the rest of it, right? I'm like, man, okay. So I, I go up to this mysterious house and they said, hey, like, here's, here's your Bible. Like, and I'm like, man, this is like, yeah, like, I've lost this. This is all, thank you. So, like, I thought I'd never, it was a Bible that I kind of, you know, I've had for years and studying all this notes and stuff on the edit. And so I was like, thank you. But in my head, I'm like, where's my laptop, though? <laughs> <laughs> so I walked, I was grateful for whatever I got, right? So I was grateful, and I walked back. And I sit down in the car, and I'm kind of like, man, kind of like bummed out. Like, man, like, did they take my laptop? Like, what happened? Like, is this like, so I sit down, and I'm like, I'm kind of just, uh, thinking it over, and I just hear the Holy Spirit say, things in life may be stolen for you, from you, but my word will never be taken from you. And, and it's in Matthew 24, it says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. I still miss my laptop. <laughs> but God uses these situations in life to teach it. Like that, that, that situation still is in my heart. Like, God's word will never be taken away from me. Things, you lose stuff, things get taken all the time, but God's word is eternal, and it is in you, and it is with you. And so, um, yeah, so I, yeah, I never got my laptop back. Unfortunate. So, like, did, did God, like, set me up to teach me? No, I, I, I think that we do a pretty good job setting ourselves up. I left my bag on the seat like an idiot, and it got stolen. Was that God's fault? No, it was my fault, but he taught me something through it. So don't think because something happens and it's messed up. Oh, God's trying to No, well, you're pretty good doing it on your own. He's able to redeem the situation and make it beautiful, right? All right, so let's continue. Uh, verse 26, uh, the second part of the, this verse says, and bring to remembrance all things that I said to you. To bring to remembrance all things that I said to you. You notice that <clears throat> throughout the scriptures, the gospel writers recall with such vivid details the account of Christ. The account uh, of the gospel is written with clarity and written with such vivid details. Naturally, this would be impossible unless it was the Holy Spirit that was bringing to remembrance. You would see throughout the scriptures. And this the disciples remembered when Jesus did such and such. He would be reminding them of things that were occurring. You know, that's why it's so important that we read our word and we study our word. That's why it's so important that we hear God's word. You may be like, man, I, I don't fully understand the I don't understand all the details of the scriptures that I'm reading. I'm telling you, you're taking in more than you realize. The preaching that you don't miss, that you come in and you're taking in more than you realize. He does, he, he brings to remembrance certain things. Now, remember this, okay? Remember this about Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit reminding you that if you don't know anything, the Holy Spirit can't remind you of anything. If there's nothing to remind you of, he's not going to remind you of Jack because there's nothing there. This, uh, just this past week, Someone, I was off do, doing whatever, and, and someone came to mind just like that. And as soon as they came to mind, a passage of scripture just went, I just, I knew it was God. I was like, I, I, I knew, he brought to my remembrance this passage. And then I sh shoot this person a message, and their exact words is, this is exactly what I needed to hear. And so when you have a well of, of what, what you have uh, put into your life through the scripture, through relationship, through preaching, through teaching. Now the Holy Spirit has a reservoir of things to draw from. But we can't live life with a shallow well. And that's what it often is. If you don't know anything, he can't remind you of anything. And so this ministry that he does is not only reminding you, but the ministry that he does, he reminds you, but he makes it relevant. There's things that he reminds you of, and then he makes it relevant in the moment. All right? So uh, we go to uh, chapter 16 now, maybe a page over or, or a couple of clicks over. This is what it says here in chapter 16, verses 12 through 13. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak 
on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will tell you of things to come. So the Holy Spirit teaches us, the Holy Spirit reminds us, and the Holy Spirit helps us by guiding us into truth. The Holy Spirit helps by guiding us into truth. He, Holy Spirit not only tells you and reveals what the truth is, but he guides you how to get there. See, it's one thing to know the truth, but it's another thing to know how to get guided to experience the truth. You know, uh, this is really significant because uh, in John chapter 8, uh, it says that Satan is the father of lies. It says when Satan speaks whatever comes out of his mouth, he lies. That's his native tongue. That, that's whatever comes out of his mouth is lies. So this is the, li the lies of the, enemies are co the, of the enemy is constantly spoken over your life, over your identity, over your past, over your future, over what God, what God can and cannot do in your life. He's constantly lying. But what's the greatest lie? The greatest lie that Satan tells us is that we should believe him instead of God. He may not say that, hey, look at me, believe in, he's not saying that. But we, we see that from the very beginning, right? In, in the Garden of Eden, he persuaded Adam and Eve by deception and a lie to trust him instead of God, which ultimately led to their spiritual death and then their physical death. And to this day, the enemy is causing deception and lies in our life that cause death. Death of our purpose, death of relationships, de de death, death of our future, death of a multitude of different things. Why? Because of these lies that are spoken. And so for thousands of years, mankind has stumbled because of the darkness of the enemy's lies. Hey, the enemy even tried it with Jesus in the desert, but guess what? He failed. He failed. And so the Holy Spirit's ministry of guiding you to truth is so vital. It's so important. It's so important. He guides you. He leads you there. I went fishing a few uh, weeks or a couple months, like a month and a half ago. And uh, uh, I don't fish often, but this time was pretty cool because uh, we went out and we had a fishing guide. And so a fishing guide, like, basically cheats for you. He does all the work. He's like, oh, you know, go there. So, so he, there's about four or five guys uh, that, that were fishing, and uh, he's telling everyone what to do. I'm like, man, this, this is not that hard. Like, I'm just casting around. I'm like, I'm, okay, I'm waiting. There's nothing. I'm wait uh, And then I, I see him, like, I see people, like, catching stuff. So I was like, hey, you want to come, like, come over here and give me some tips? He's like, yeah, they're right there. I'm like, they're right where? He's like, yeah, they're right there. I'm like, I don't see anything. We got like x-ray vision. He's like, yeah, they're right there. You can, and he's going into the whole mind of the fish and all this type of stuff. And so I do exactly what he says. I cast it over there. Boom. I catch something like almost immediately. And so uh, basically a lot of times we navigate throughout life without a guide and we're wasting our time. We don't know where the truth is. We don't know what we're doing. We don't know the truth about our marriage. We don't know the truth about what God is calling us to do. We don't know the truth about culture. We don't know anything. And so we don't have a guide. Now we have the spirit of God with us as a guide saying, no, nah, that's not true. I know that's popular. I know that's what he said. I know what that person said. That's not right. The truth is right here. Go cast your net over there. Go cast your rod over there. And so Holy Spirit is with you to guide you into all truth. In fact, John 8, 20, uh, 31 says it like this. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So this is not just God uh, guiding you to some truth. No, he's setting you free. You, you have literally a guide of freedom with you. That he's leading you to freedom in every emotional freedom, or freedom from addiction, freedom from different things, freedom from all types of things. He is a guide with you to lead you not only to truth, but to freedom. And it says here in verse uh, 13, 16 verse 13, and he will tell you of things to come. He will tell you of things to come. The, the Holy Spirit is our teacher. The Holy Spirit reminds us the Holy Spirit guides us to all truth. And the Holy Spirit tells us of what's to come. Tells us, of, wouldn't, it, wouldn't it be nice to know what's around the corner? Wouldn't that be nice? Anyone ever been blindsided by something in their life? Like, man, had I known that was going to happen, I would have probably done things a little bit differently. 
I would have prepared a little bit better. I would have, I would have done things a little bit better. But the Holy Spirit, and this is the basis of what prophecy is. He tells us of what's to come. Uh, many of the decisions, not every of the decisions, but many of the decisions that I've made and that were big life-altering decisions, the Holy Spirit has let me know in some type of way. Not the details always. Sometimes it's just an inner a sense that transition or change is coming in. Sometimes it's more descriptive in details. And this is what he desires is to let us know what's around that bend and what's around that corner. A good friend of mine uh, um, that lives in California, entrepreneur, very, very wealthy man, uh, he, he was telling me about this time where uh, he, he was, he, the Holy Spirit woke him up in the middle of the night. He woke him up and he had this impression in his heart. It wasn't a voice. He had the impression in his heart to, to move all of his stock positions uh, out from, from his current holdings that he had. He said, this is bizarre. It's like... But he's like, I just sense this is the spirit on it. So he calls his broker the next day. And he says, hey, I want to I move this position that I have. And the broker's like, are you kidding me? He's like, look at the returns that you've had over this period of time. He said, yeah, I know. I, know. I just want you to, to, to uh, remove those positions that I have. And do you know within that next week or so, that whole stock plummeted that he had massive holdings in? Wouldn't you all like that in your life? Wouldn't you like that? Wouldn't you like that guidance in your life? See, the Holy Spirit is telling us of what things are to come. And, and, and we'll talk about that in the weeks to come, but this is out of a basis of relationship. We just run to when we have to go, oh my God, like my boss said, they're having cutbacks. What am I supposed to do? Like, no, you're, you're to cultivate this relationship with them as you go. Right? Oh, okay. So, um, verse 14 and 15 in chapter 16 of John says this. Uh, he will glorify me for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. All things the Father has are mine. Therefore, I, I said that he will take of mine and declare them to you. The Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit helps by revealing Jesus to us. The Holy Spirit helps by revealing Jesus to us. It is the Holy Spirit's uh, subject of teaching is Christ Jesus. He is the one, listen, he is the one that makes Jesus real to us. He's the one that makes Jesus real and tangible to our lives. He's the one that causes the person of Christ to be real in how we live and how we walk our life. And above all else, he is looking to point to Jesus and to reveal him and to glorify him. That's why oftentimes like, oh, you know, don't, you know, don't over you know, don't, don't overemphasize the Holy Spirit, but, but this is the reality. When we, when we engage the Holy Spirit, he points to Jesus. Oh, don't go to the extremes. I understand, I understand where people are coming from that, but I'm saying the natural progression is if we're spending time with the Holy Spirit and he's not pointing to Jesus, then there, there's a disconnect somewhere. All right? He's always bringing Jesus to us. Let me have the worship team come up. He's always bringing Jesus to us. And then this is what, uh, in uh, the end, well, uh, chapter 16, verse 7, this is what Jesus says. He says, nevertheless, everybody say nevertheless. I tell you the truth. He's like saying, look, for real, for real, look, <laughs> you're not going to believe what I'm about to say, but look, I t I'm telling you the truth. I'm telling you right now what the truth is. He says, it is to your advantage that I go away, for if, would, if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. Do you understand what he just said? Jesus said, it's, it's to your benefit. It, it's to your advantage that I'm going away. It's, it, it, you're, you're better off with me going away than I'm, I'm sending the Holy Spirit now. It's kind of hard. You, you got to think, these disciples were walking with Jesus, living with Jesus, eating with Jesus. He was providing for them. He was protecting them. He was advocating for them. He was doing all, he was counseling them. He was doing all of this stuff for them. And he's saying, hey, it's, it's better that I go away. They're like, what? What do you mean it's better that you go away? And so without doubt, the disciples may have felt threatened in some way, right? They may have felt that, hey, Jesus is going away. We don't want it any other way. Jesus, we want you here. And so maybe today you feel uneasy. Maybe you feel threatened by the Holy Spirit. Is it because 
you're happily in your comfort zone? Are you afraid of what the Holy Spirit might do to you? Are you worried about what the Holy Spirit may require of you? Are you worried about what the Holy Spirit may ask of you? Do you think you'll lose something? If you make yourself vulnerable and totally open to, do you, you, you think you'll miss out on something? Are you afraid he may embarrass you? Are you afraid he might have you change? You know, the enemy has been pressing so hard on the matters of the Holy Spirit since the very beginning. Jesus said, I'll send another just like me who will say what I would say, who would do what I would do, who would help you the way I've helped my disciples to teach you sitting at the feet of the rabbi, listening to the teaching from Jesus right there, the Holy Spirit. He knows about everything, not just the things of Jesus. He knows about your job. Remember, that's why we set the basis of uh, the Holy Spirit being um, omniscient, all-knowing. He knows everything. What are we, what are we worried about? Will we open our heart to the help of the Holy Spirit? Will we open our hearts to his ministry in our life? You know, Jesus paid a massive, massive price. Listen, his name is Holy Spirit. For Holy Spirit to live in sinful man, he needed to be made holy. And the only way that was done was through the blood of Jesus Christ. The blood of Jesus Christ washing you and cleansing you enough so that the very presence of God would dwell in you, that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You're the temple of the Holy Spirit. That it cost his blood. It cost his life on the cross, not only for forgiveness, but forgiveness was on the way to him indwelling you and to having a relationship with you. I jumped in that pool and screamed out, help. And my sister didn't even think twice. She jumped in and she saved me. Listen, how much more the Holy Spirit if you call out for help? How much more? How much, how much more would he be willing to jump in whatever, whatever deep waters, whatever situation, whatever is going on, whether it's lack of understanding of the word, whether it's spiritual apathy, whether it's addiction, whether it's whatever you have going on, whatever those deep waters may be, the Holy Spirit is ready and willing to jump in. All you have to do is say, help. See, in that word, help, is pride is crushed. In that word, help, we have to humble ourselves. In that word, help means that we are unable to do what ourselves, what only God can do for us, help. Let's all stand up.